Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I, I have to tell you this because uh, my mother and grandmother were high school teachers. And so this is the first academic event that I'm doing that my mother is interested in. So <laughs> thank you so much for that honor of being here. Um, so uh, Susan, Susan mentioned the project that we were doing in Cairo. And this is something that's emerged from that enterprise where what we were trying to do is actually get um, academics but also practitioners, um, lawyers, poets, um, government officials, businessmen, all together in a room and actually think about the things that can't be said or the things that nobody wants to see. And in a place like Cairo, that, that's actually a lot of the story um, in terms of what's actually happening. And so, so this is an attempt to kind of take those lessons and begin to think about how we can reimagine the Indian Ocean where we take into account those people who are forgotten. Um, so I want to begin by telling you a story which in many ways is very emblematic of certain paradigms of the Indian Ocean. Um, and this story uh, was written originally in 1790 um, by the botanist and traveler Jacques-Henri um, Bernadette de Saint-Pierre, who it was called the Café of Surat. And the story is interesting, so Tolstoy loved the story and he wrote another version of it. Um, but the story is uh, set in the Gujarati port town of Surat, uh, where um, there was a coffee house, apparently, where many strangers gathered in the afternoon and a Persian theologian who had gone mad um, from a lifetime of contemplating God entered and loudly declared that there was no God. Um, and then sipping his cup of opium, he demanded of his black slave if God existed, who then produced a fetish object as proof of God's existence. Then a Brahmin, scoffing that he could think that God could be carried in a belt, insisted that God was none other than Brahma. And so, so on and so forth. So all these you know, people start to sort of uh, Catholic missionaries and um, a Danish uh, Protestant minister from Trankabart, they all start to jump in on this conversation about whether or not there's God. And so eventually what uh, happens is, quote, a tumult arose in the coffee house because all the foreigners then assembled who were of many religions, among whom there were still um, Abyssinian Christians, Copts, Tartarian Lamas, Aravian Ishmaelites, um, or worshippers of fire, all disputed the nature of God on his cult, and each maintaining that the true religion existed nowhere but in his own country. So there was this big fight that happens in this coffee house. Um, now, what's interesting about this story for our purposes is that this is a parable which is very familiar to us of um, differences of identities kind of run amok, right? Um, but a resolution is achieved in the story when a Confucian relates another conversation with precise parallels to the debate at hand that he had heard on the island of Sumatra. The debate among African, Asian, and European seafarers concerned the nature of the sun. And it was only settled when an English pilot explained the heliocentric theory of the earth. Making the parallel with the theological debate clear, um, the Confucian concluded, it is equally true of God as of the sun. Each man believes he possesses him alone in his own chapel or at least in his own country. Thus spoke the disciple of Confucius and all the people in the coffee house who had been disputing about the excellence of their religions maintained a profound silence. So this is how the story ends. Now, what's interesting is that even though the story is supposed to take place in Surat and in, in Gujarat, it's actually fulfilled completely the ideal of the 18th century European cafe. So this was, this was really a transplanted European cafe in this, in this um, setting in Gujarat as a as, as sort of public social space. And it embodied the principle of universal access for all humans capable of abiding, abiding by the conventions of argumentation and what Jürgen Habermas calls a kind of social intercourse that far from presupposing the equality of status disregarded status altogether. Now, seductive, this is kind of seductive vision. Like we can all get together and we can have a conversation and we can debate about God. And, and as a practice, this is interesting, right? It ends, however, with a kind of oppressive silence. Everybody shuts up. And it, in which what happens is that all of the interlocutors, regardless of their external difference, essentially are semblances of each other in their 
acceptance of a tradition of rationalism that owed much more to European Enlightenment thought and very little to the Indian Ocean. Um, so this is almost a kind of parody of cosmopolitanism in an early modern key, like full of the tropes that characterize this period that sometimes we call the first stage of globalization. Um, so the port city, the spice islands, seafarers and travelers, black slaves and missionaries, European company officials and diasporic traders, the iterant men of letters of Asia and Europe, they all come together in this story. What is striking is that this story, or at least the stroke, it still structure in many ways the tropes of the Indian Ocean today, um, as historians, as artists and writers um, think about it. So undoubtedly the field has grown in sophistication and depth, departing from its initial concern with sort of Braudelian debates on the Mediterranean um, and world systems theory. So, so and, and as a result, our suspicion of these tropes has also grown among historians. So to the Eurocentrism of such a vision of cosmopolitanism, scholars have mined what um, one of the articles I sent by Isabel Hoffmeyer um, gives a nice overview of what's happening in the Indian Ocean historiography. She calls a rich archive of transnational imaginations um, centered in translocal religious ecumenes, whether Buddhist or Islamic or um, Hindu, and imperial or diasporic formations of belonging and commerce. Recently, the intersection of these formations, the ways in which they cross-cut, like uh, Fahad's work yesterday, um, and the ways that various diasporas kind of come together to create this fascinating um, legal and economic culture um, in Zanzibar, that kind of work is also beginning to happen. And, and even there's now work on non-elite and vernacular realms of the oceanic world. So uh, histories of slavery, these things are beginning to happen in the field. But, what I want to suggest is that we still, um, we still cast the Indian Ocean as a zone of human activity that's particularly productive of universalisms, um, of a more or less kind of thought out projects, right? Um, but historiographically, um, in the confrontation and intersection of various universalisms, whether imperial or diasporic, the outside, what happens outside of these universalisms, gets left out. Um, so what this work is trying to do is to imagine what this outside might be and why it might be important to kind of think about it. So my own desire to find an outside might have been from my recent wanderings in Cairo, um, a city in which Amitav Kosh, this is another writer that, was, um, that, people, that uh, Hoffmeyer talks about, um, once mined a series of interrupted conversations in which Egypt spoke to India through the byways of the Indian Ocean. Uh, so in an antique land, Kosh's extraordinary record of that conversation, if you haven't read the book, please do. It's beautiful. It really is one of the most beautiful books uh, I've read. Um, he sought these connections in the medieval past, Sorry, but it was right, in an antique land. Um, he sought these connections in the medieval past, but it was actually informed by um, a spirit of a far more recent conversation. So the non-aligned movement in which Gamal Abdel Nasser um, and Jawaharlal Nehru um, played such prominent roles linked India and Egypt together in what Ghosh terms an attempt to restore and recommence the exchanges and conversations that had been interrupted by the long centuries of European imperial dominance long after the political ties that originally bound these states together have died. So I mean, at this point, it's very apparent to those of us who have worked on India. India has very clear imperial ambitions <laughs> in the Indian Ocean world and beyond, right? Um, a cultural memory of that xenophilic spirit still lingers. Um, if only in the fondness for Bollywood, so everywhere I would walk in, <laughs> Cairo people would stop me and sing me songs, and you know they all still love Amitabh oh, Bachchan, so, which is why I had a great time in Cairo. <laughs> um, but uh, the superficiality of these ties are, are obvious, right? I mean, there's actually very little real exchange between India and Egypt and, uh, at a cultural level anymore. Um, and it, and it actually hides the diplomatic reality. Um, so at one point, um, so I had issues <laughs> with visas, which tells you a little bit about the diplomatic re reality because I'm an Indian citizen. 
Um, so during the 15 months that I was basically in legal limbo, waiting for a residence permit in Cairo, um, I was told unofficially by a sympathetic member of the Ministry of Interior um, that India is now on a list of 14 countries, which includes Syria, Iraq, Libya, um, Palestinians, um, that Egypt doesn't want citizens from there. So, so that's actually like the reality of what's happening diplomatically. So even though there's all this discourse about non-aligned movement and Indians and Egyptians are together and we have this rich shared history of the Indian Ocean, this is actually what the situation really is. Um, so in those months, I mean, so particularly after the military coup of um, June 30th, um, there were army checkpoints and armored tanks and these very skittish uniform boys sort of bristling with guns. <laughs> it made the prospect of walking without papers in Cairo, even for such a privileged foreigner as myself, a little scary. <laughs> Um, but what's really interesting is that the ebb and flow of Cairo's traffic, which were cur curtailed by these sort of physical manifestations of the idea of borders, um, the Indian Ocean still laps its streets in the sense that, you know, you can see African textiles fluttering in the markets in Ataba, uh, you can have goat curry, a fabulous place just off this blind alley, um, where uh, the only decoration are these advertising bills to send goods to Sudan. Um, and, and wire money there. Um, um, get a great cup of coffee in a Yemeni ehwa and do'i, or you, know, the, you see Bohri um, um, Shia women like in their wimpled robes near Sayyid al Zainab. Um, you can attend a Lutheran service held in Newer at St. Andrew's Church um, in downtown Cairo. Um, and you'll see Malayali and Filipino nurses sort of gossiping in the corridors of like Egypt's most exclusive hospitals. So, um, and of course, Indonesian maids pushing prams and things in the malls in Heliopolis and that. Um, so, let's one think that this is anything like that fictional coffee house in Surat. What's important is that many of the denizens of these Indian Ocean uh, places would never interact across the boundaries of their homes, their neighborhoods, um, their class, their gender. Um, so these are not necessarily what, what Giancarlo was saying. It's just that, you know, like Muslims and Christians, it's not that they were living together. Like, I mean, they live side by side. Mm -hmm. or, and, and in some ways, they, they, there was no reason necessarily to interact at all. Um, moreover, much of this world has to be invisible because it's illegal. So. Cairo is a city of, by conservative estimates, some 120,000 refugees, um, many of them from the east coast of Africa, so that, so that area of the Indian Ocean world, um, and now increasingly also from the Arabian Gulf. So, so, I mean, especially after the war in Yemen, there are tons and tons of Yemeni refugees coming in. Now, um, those lucky enough to escape the pipeline of Egypt doesn't really have a policy in place for refugees, and refugees, uh, if they're caught, end up in these really terrible prisons um, near Alexandria on the north coast, you know, Abu Ir, which most people think of as a resort town, but I see it as this place of these really, really terrifying prisons. Um, so people who, you know, manage to escape that visibility from the state, they sort of disappear into the city. So, the, so Cairo is an Indian Ocean city still, but it's illegally so and invisibly so, because it has to be. Um, and so occasionally, these people come into dramatic view, uh, as in the case of the Sudanese woman who set herself on, fi on fire in front of the UNHCR offices after the revolution of January 25th. But these occasions are very rare. So generally, the Indian Ocean in Cairo is an invisible one. right? So the Indian Ocean world, as reflected today in Cairo, is actually largely one of refugees, and more broadly, those who exist in the shadow land of the law. Um, bodies invested with no rights, but fully vulnerable to the force of violence that the state can then execute on these bodies, right? Um, so this material condition probably constitutes a greater common ground for the Yemeni, Eritrean, Nuer, Dinka, Somali, Bangladeshi, Indonesian bodies who live in Cairo than anything else, right? I mean, it's, it's not clear. I mean, they don't share religions. 
many of them. They don't share languages. I mean, unless, you know, people actually speak Arabic because not only we're Franca, but I mean, they actually have different languages. Like, I mean, people don't speak the same languages at home, right, as they would on the street. So what really actually they have in common is this vulnerability, this legal vulnerability and this invisibility that, that is part of that vulnerability. Um, so, so while the currents of the Indian Ocean, like the ecological, <coughs> cultural, economic, and historical currents, these know no boundaries, as we've seen all through this um, week. Um, the bodies that are carried by these waters are constantly vulnerable to the borders erected all across the Indian Ocean Rim um, in the name of nations, of states, of religious acumens, of legal and economic frameworks in the service of sort of transnational companies, right? So there are all these borders that exist all across the Indian Ocean Rim and that bodies that have to pass through them are deeply vulnerable to them. Um, so the need to, so the, I'm telling you all of this is a way to kind of invest why, I'm, and this is not to say that I don't see huge value in these frameworks of cosmopolitanism, of universalism, as, as a way to understand the Indian Ocean world. But I'm saying that there's also a need to think about an outside of, of what happens to those people who cannot participate in these kinds of projects of, and, uh, and, and who are, in fact, deeply vulnerable to the borders on which these projects are erected, right? Um, so part of what I've been doing, um, and I'll share this with you because as educators you might find this interesting, um, the framework that I've been developing owes a lot to this um, radical French educator, Fernand de Denis, who used to work with um, what we would call profoundly autistic children in the 60s and Savannah, like so people who didn't have language. And what he was trying to do was to develop a pedagogical practice that wasn't violent to them, that wasn't based on us demanding that they exist on the same terms as we do, in terms of, you know, so it's, it, he sort of completely um, foresaw debates on neurobiological diversity and things like that that are beginning to happen now. Um, but he makes this beautiful, beautiful point um, and he writes in this kind of aphoristic, poetic way as a way to try to imagine for us um, what being on the common ground with these people would mean, um, where we're not forcing them to be like us, right? And, he, and he, he begins with the point that, you know, it's not autistic people who create violence, it's people with language. I mean, like, so it's people who have these very self-conscious identities. These are, this is where the violence in the world comes from, not from people who don't exist in language and they don't exist in notions of identity. And so his, his whole work kind of comes, comes from this point that any kind of borders, any kind of lines that we draw that separate, and that's where violence begins. What was this name again? Fernand Deligny. Um, and uh, he had, in one of his aphorisms, and this, this is where the quotation, there remains a sea, which is outside, comes from. He says, in the dictionary, we see that the word boh, which used to speak of edges, borders, has ended up indicating the vessel itself, monte a board, um, climb a board, people would say. There remains the sea, which would be outside, right? So what I'm trying to do here is to think about what that outside would mean. Now, in, um, so I, I heard from uh, some of you guys that, you know, you have visual learners in your classrooms, and so I'm, what I'm, I'm I don't really work with visual sources, but I'll, I'll try to sort of give you images that I think tell the same story that I'm telling you here. So this is an image of two Russians and Surat, and you can see there's this kind of, it's, it's a fictive coming together of you know, people who are clearly from different religious backgrounds, and, but there's actually no interaction, right? So, so that, that cosmopolitan world of the coffee house is clearly a sort of fiction. Um, now, when, what, what, what is interesting, so one of the other um, articles that was posted was um, this brilliant piece by Aung San Ho um, uh, on 
I think the view from the other boat was that mm -hmm. posted. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fabulous, fabulous article. Um, but what that article, I mean, so uh, what what that article tries to do is to show that you know it's not just the Europeans who um, come with this universalism of empire, but in response, actually, like um, in this case, Hadrami. Um, a diasporic communities, you know, counter that with another universalism, right? Um, but what's interesting is that this all begins with certain borders that the Portuguese bring into the Indian Ocean. So when he, when Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope, he stumbled into a world wet by various circuits, predicated on certain innate attitudes towards the ocean. But what they did very quickly um, is in, institute new legal and cultural attitudes towards the ocean, which was the idea that you could actually own the ocean, which was not um, indigenous to the Indian Ocean as an idea. And so they, would, they started to um, institute licensing, and you have to basically pass through these Portuguese um, borders in order to have access to the ocean. And one of the things that they, the Portuguese demanded from... Um, from uh, from the from the indigenous kingdoms on the Carolite coast, where they first got there, is that Muslims should be excluded from the uh, from not just from from the sea. Um, now, obviously, this would provoke certain kinds of very important responses, and there's a really interesting tradition of anti-Portuguese polemics that starts to develop here. Um, and uh, th these are written in Arabic, um, so these were uh, Muslim scholars. Um, the first of these polemicists was the noted scholar Sheikh Zainuddin um, the first. So uh, Einstein Ho mentions one his grandson, but his, the first person to start this polemical tradition was Zainuddin the first, um, and he lived in 1467 to 1521. And he was a son of a Yemeni migrant to Cochin and a nephew to a celebrated scholar and judge of that city. And he went with that uncle to Bonani, which actually, um, this is the mosque in Bonani, and it's still a really, really important um, legal and scholarly center in, in, um, in Kerala. Uh, he went on to study in Calicut before leaving India to study with prominent Egyptian scholars. He also studied with Sufi masters. And then he eventually returns to Konani and built this mosque. Um, and his descendants served as scholars and religious leaders of the Muslim community from the Pearl Coast of Damarnar, so on that side of the, of the subcontinent, um, all the way up the Malabar Coast. Among his extensive Arabic corpus, um, which included philosophical works, sermons, um, and commentaries and translations, he also wrote a poem, um, which is called An Exhortation to Believers to Fight Against the Cross Worshippers, um, stressing the religious responsibility for Muslims um, to sort of resist violently um, the Portuguese. And the poem sort of describes the conditions of unfreedom that the Portuguese had brought to Malabar through these really vivid images of captivity. So he says the Portuguese tyrannized us in Malabar, taking people captives, enslaving the believers, putting them into narrow quarters like sheds for senseless sheep. Right? So this is what the Portuguese have brought to Malabar through this idea of owning the sea and through these systems of licensing and customs. So basically now you have to take permission of them to have access to the sea. And this is really important because after all, as religious Muslims, they have to be able to go to Mecca, right? So they have to go on Hajj. And this is one of the reasons why you have to have access to the sea. Um, so his, extort his exhortations are basically religious war against the Portuguese, and it's unambiguous. He says, it is the duty of every Muslim to fight the Portuguese with weapons, body, and money. Don't allow sovereignty to the Portuguese at any cost. So it's very clear that they know what's happening. And I mean, this is not that they, they have a very clear idea of the kind of new violence that the Portuguese have not brought into this ocean, right? Um, his grandson, this is the person uh, Einstein Ho mentions in his article, continues this polemic tradition um, in a book entitled um, 
a gift of the holy warriors in matters regarding the Portuguese. Um, and it's composed in Malabar in the 1570s and dedicated to Ali Adad Shah, um, the ruler of the Deccan Sultanate of Bijapur. Um, and it's basically to mobilize a Muslim military response to the Portuguese. And he was educated at the famous Madrasa in Bonani, and then uh, he studied in um, the Middle East. And, um, and then he, when he returned to Malabar, he taught at Bonani and kept up his scholarly connections with the Arab world. He was also a diplomat. Um, so he actually um, had, had served as an envoy for the Hindu king, um, the Zamorin, the Samudri Raja of Calicut, on diplomatic missions to Egypt and Turkey, um, in part to actually garner a military support against the Portuguese. Um, and so in the introduction of this text, he actually describes the advent of Islam um, as a peaceful process uh, in Malabar, in which foreign Muslims had come and prospered under non-Muslim kings who, continued, who had continued to adhere to their ancient rights until the cities of Malabar boasted large Muslim communities. This happy condition did not last because Muslims deviated from the path of righteousness and that's why Allah sent the Portuguese to <laughs> punish them and to make them come back to the path of, um, of uh, righteous living. Um, and it's interesting, like in the 17th century, Portuguese Jesuits think about the advent of the Dutch, um, which basically causes the decline of the Portuguese, in the same terms. We've been bad Christians, and God has sent us the Dutch to punish us. <laughs> so so it's a very, it's a, it's, there's an interesting parallel there. Um, and so what's interesting, though, is that he railed against the rest of the Muslim worlds sultans and emirs for not coming to the aid of the Malabari Muslims um, in pursuit of their worldly interests and at the expense of their holy duties to struggle, jihad, um, in the path of Allah. Um, the book, um, the Sheikh made clear, was to remind these rulers of this obligation. So in his, um, in his explication of jihad, the Sheikh mentions two sorts of obligations towards two sets of unbelievers. The first is the group that dwells permanently in the land of the Muslims. Um, the second, those who invade Muslim territories. The latter is what the Sheikh claims Malabar is experiencing. What, this is intriguing in that uh, he basically classifies the territory of Hindu rulers as Muslim land. So actually, I mean, so the Zamorin is, is a Hindu ruler, right? But he's, he's, not, he's not seeing He's not saying that there's a, there's a reason to struggle against the Hindus. He's saying there is a reason to struggle religiously against the Portuguese, but the Hindu rulers, is, it's as if you're still living in Muslim rule land, right? Um, so as he explains, it is well known that the Muslims of Malabar do not have a leader who possesses power and can exercise authority over them and be mindful of their welfare. All of them are subjects of the rulers who are non-believers. Notwithstanding, these rulers kept on fighting their foreign enemies who were trying to dominate them. They have already spent their wealth to the extent of their means in the cause of the struggle with the generous help from the Muslim-friendly Zamorin. Yet the Portuguese enemies have been able to cause the Muslims large-scale loss of life and to rout them out of their commercial and industrial enterprises and to destroy their houses. So in, 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 Sheikh, um, in the Sheikh's analysis, the category of the other is this complex and meshing of the separate car categories of foreigner to Malabar and unbelievers to Islam. So the Portuguese as foreign unbelievers are clearly other, right? They don't, they don't have any place here. Um, but the non-Muslim rulers of Malabar, and particularly his patron, the Zamorin, are actually contrasted favorably with foreign believers. Um, the sultans and emirs of the Muslim world who ignored the plight of the Malabari Muslims. Um, so, it, so the cross-cutting wage in which belonging to the diasporic world of the Ummah and the locality of Malabar actually marks his own relationship to Malabar. It, and and it's, it's really interesting when he talks about his Hindu neighbors, I mean, he talks about them with this kind of ethnographic distance. Like, they're really foreign, except he's grown up living next to them. And especially he talks about matrilineal customs, it's like, oh, that's... And, and he says that some Muslims have even started to adopt these practices, and that, that's no good, right? So, the, so even at home, there's always this kind of, you are different, and, you know, so it's, it, the question of identity is really, really complex here. Um, but what's important is that, is that now there is a question of identity. It's becoming important 
to say this is what we are, right? We are Malabari Muslims, and we have a particular history and we have a particular identity, right? Um, and uh, you can also see this um, with uh, with regard to the last person I'll talk about in this polemical tradition, um, his successor, uh, Muhammad bin Ahmed. Um, he makes the sort of a very similar argument again in this book called The Clear Victory of the Zamarin, uh, who loves Muslims. <laughs> That's the name of the book. Um, and the poem actually describes the coming together of Muslims, Nair warriors, and the naval force of the Kunjali Marakars um, to jointly attack the Portuguese fort at Talikat in 1571. Um, and it's dedicated to the Zamorin. It was written between 1579 and 1607. And it might have actually been a rebuke to, um, to the Adil Shah's signing of a peace treaty with the Portuguese. Um, because the timing is such that it seems that he's sort of reminding the Adil Shah that what you're doing is no good. Like, these, these guys are our en enemies. Um, so, uh, the, the Chalier Fort, the, which was owned by the Portuguese, is built in 1531 and had become a major obstacle to the Zamorin's foreign and inland trade and the attack thus had great symbolic value as well as a military import, right? Because again, it's about access to the sea. Um, and the poem claimed that the story of the battle had spread all over the world, particularly to Syria and Iraq, um, a reminder of the networks that tied Malabar to the Dar al Islam. Um, the, the poem paints a picture of the Portuguese as this kind of parasitic intruder into the life form of these networks. Um, it, it's, it, it declares that the, the Portuguese were there to monopolize the trade in expensive vices, but they did it dishonestly. This is important. Um, they presented themselves at the Zamorin's Darbar with gifts um, and claimed to be desirous of living as ordinary subjects. Thus, they lay low as servants until they got a foothold in the Zamorin's domain and then turned. So it was basically this idea that the Portuguese came in like everybody else in the Indian Ocean world, and they were willing to sort of live by these terms. And then as soon as they got a foothold, they turned hostile. Um, and what's interesting is that if we consider this polemical production, what, what's, what's, what's happening is that these art writers are articulating an identity, a consciousness of belonging to a particular community in the overlapping spaces of the Dar al Islam, of Malabar, and of the Indian Ocean. Um, yet, and this is where Anteng Ho's article is so good, this, this articulation of identity is itself a sign of the kind of end of this way of being in the Indian Ocean, where it wasn't necessary to mark these identities so important. There was, it was, the identity itself is a marker of the violence that was being done to them, right? Um, and what en ends up happening, as I think shows, is that the sense of identity eventually crystallizes into a, into a form, a diaspora against empire, a universalism that's opposed to the other universalism of European colonial dominance, and, it's the, and it eventually leads to its own forms of violence. Right? From the beginning, this is calls for violence, to fight the violence that's happening to them. So identity here is linked to the erection of borders, and deeply linked to violence. So as soon as these borders come up, you get two, th two, two kinds of things that start to happen. You have to suddenly be something. Like it's, it's why we have to be Indian or Indonesian or Yemeni when we go to passport control, even if when we're not out of passport control, we might live in totally different ways. Right? Uh, but the border itself creates both identity and violence. Um, so. Uh, this is interesting because um, so the Indian Ocean port city is um, you can see how differently the Europeans and uh, depending on whether you were looking at it from the sea or whether you were looking at it from inland in uh, the subcontinent you actually have very very different relationships of what a port city is so this is an image from Sora, uh, of, of uh, the Dutch um, uh, uh, Philip Baldeus um, and it's from the 1667, uh, and you can see the importance of the ocean, and again these tropes, right, of mariners, of slaves, of all of the all of the kind of tropes that we were talking about. 
This is another <laughs> view of um, Surat, and it's from uh, an illustration of uh, the Akbar Nama. So when, and it's about the Mughal emperor's entry into Surat, so it's this kind of triumphal entry. And what, what's interesting is that the port city in the subcontinent functioned in this kind of two ways, that there was a sort of freedom that port cities had in the sense that internal modes of sovereignty and dominance um, were relaxed. So, uh, but there was this whole other world of violent politics that's going on in the subcontinent that has nothing to do with the Indian Ocean side of the same port city. Um, so the next episode of um, unfreedom that I want to talk about it comes from this uh, really, really interesting um, text, uh, this French physician, Charles Dillon. He, um, he was imprisoned by the Portuguese Inquisition. Um, and so in Daman in the 1670s, um, he was recovering from his voyage, and he, had, and he used to basically, he says this in the book, he carried around a Bible and used to quote from the decrees of the Council of Trent which was deeply suspicious Catholic activity, according to the Portuguese. So, they, so he was hauled up in front of the Inquisition. Um, and then he writes these two accounts of his vo of travels. Uh, so basically he's taken via the Inquisition, like the galleys, the galleys carrying him uh, as a prisoner. And he eventually ends up in Lisbon and then escapes to France, where he then writes this account of his imprisonment in the Inquisition. Um, and so the, the, this, this was a sensational record um, of this inquisition of Goa, and it's published in 1687, and then um, in Leiden first, and then in Paris the following year. And the second account is, I mean, this is in many ways a really conventional sort of travel narrative of the, of the, uh, of the Portuguese empire, but one that's viewed through prison bars. And that's what makes it really interesting. Um, so uh, he... He basically, um, he, you know, he sort of explains the circumstances of his arrest, and he's very clear that he's a good Catholic, right? Um, so he's very clear about that. Um, and then he talks about his journey first to the East, like past Galavet and the Cape of Good Hope. And, and then he also explored the western coast of India, spending some time in the Mughal town of Surat. And then he described the sort of petty kingdoms of the Malagar coast. Um, and he, then he returns to Daman, and that's where he's arrested. From Daman, his prisoners took him in chains to Basain and then Goa uh, to face the Inquisition. And then he gives a really gruesome, scatological description of the horrors of the Inquisitorial prisons. Um, and then uh, he's, uh, he's basically sentenced um, at, at, to an auto da fe, and then he's sent in irons aboard a Portuguese vessel that goes to Lisbon with brief stays in Salvador on the way. So. Um, What's interesting is that what he does do is that he notices something. And he notices something really interesting, which is that Goa has a lot more in common with Salvador in Brazil than it has with Surat. So, so he, what he's starting to see is that you know, the, the divisions of East and West of the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, they don't work. Right? If you look at the world through the point of view of the Portuguese Empire, Goa is a lot more like Salvador than it is like Soros. Sort of. um, and so the, this is where it's sort of interesting to look at his account of Salvador. Uh, he was apparently allowed to roam freely during the day and was only required to return to the prison at night. And his methods kind of comparative, the way that we as historians are comparative. Right? He tells us that Salvador had the most comfortable prisons <laughs> of the Portuguese Empire. <laughs> he tells us, too, that the chases and palanquins in, uh, of the sort in, in, in use in Goa were not the custom here, but the wealthy in Salvador traveled in equal comfort on hammocks carried by slaves. In each case, his account is built on comparisons of the various cities of his experience in the Indian and Atlantic Ocean of the Portuguese Empire. Um, and so you can actually see what he saw here. So this is, uh, this is a picture of the palanquins in Goa. This is from a very famous um, set of engravings that were done by the De Bruy brothers of a uh, Dutch account of Goa. Um, and then this is also, this is a, a German traveler in Brazil, and this is the hammocks that he used to see in use in northeastern Brazil. Um, and so, of course, these, you know, the palanquins are not the same as hammocks, but the, the slaves, the way in which the wealthy are carried, I mean, this is, he was noticing the similarities here. 
Um, and what's important is that he, he, he also talks about how sort is very different from Goa. So what, what ties Goa and Salvador and all of these cities of the Portuguese Empire together is certain conventions of architecture and urban planning um, marked by coastal fortification. This is really important. Again, borders. Um, and anti-diluvian, sort of pre-Tridentine, but devout Catholicism, dovetailing systems of urban, imperial, and religious governance, which is the same across these cities, and a diverse population contained through the strict maintenance of social hierarchies, at one, at, subtended at one end by slavery. Right? So Goa is much like Salvador in this respect. Um, and his account of Surat highlighted how different the Indian Ocean port city is from these Portuguese port cities that are beginning to happen there. So under the control of the Muslim Mughals, Delon noted the importance of the office of the Shah Bandar, or customs, and the religious tolerance that, um, that was there in the city. And its fortifications, this is important, its fortifications were such that one remarked that any European power would be easily able to conquer it. Right? So Surat is not fortified in the way that Goa is fortified. Um, his account of his entrance to Goa is first marked by ports, through which he passed into the city's heart, a heart dominated by the church and various religious orders. Right? So in the same ocean, these are not the same kinds of cities. Goa is not like Surat. This is what Delano is telling us. Um, there were sort of costs to this new form of city life that the Portuguese bring to the Indian Ocean, right? Um, the history of Malacca is interesting here. Um, so the, while the Portuguese initially tried to retain the original open structure of the city, um, over time they increasingly fortified it and imposed religious restrictions. So the same sorts of borders that they were setting up elsewhere. Um, firstly, by increasing tax rates for non-Christian traders, exorbitantly. So what ended up happening is that the various ethnic and religious mercantile communities that used to live in the city um, left and it discreets the port, the, basically it ended up costing the Portuguese money, but more importantly that they then, when they left, they went to the rival sultanates of Johor and Aceh, and which then increasingly posed credible military threats. So they took their money and they were then funding the sultanates that would then fight the Portuguese. So there were costs to this kind of imperial um, status model that comes from Aluka. Um, and also what's important is that the Portuguese were not all um, sort of parties to this imperial status model of how to live in the Indian Ocean world. So the, the Casados um, not only resisted it in many different ways, but they themselves emigrated into Indian Ocean port cities and they lived in these what were called bandels or bandesh. In, in, all, in all of these Indian Ocean port cities as part of the ethnic mosaic of these cities. Um, and they were actually explicitly illegal and, and the Ishtar of India would actually worry about this, these bandesh a lot. Um, although it's, you know, there, there, there were sort of um, benefits too to having these Portuguese living in these cities. Um, but, so this is, um, this, is, this, this shows you where the Portuguese lived in Siam, um, in Thailand. So this is a map of the city there. And then this is actually a, the church of the Bandel in Bengal, where so, um, it still exists. It's a very dilapidated condition. But the Portuguese basically were not just living in their own fortified cities. Like they were going into these Indian Ocean cities and living like Indian Ocean peoples. Um, so the last, so the, what, 